Okay, let's get started. Welcome to the final Smart Grid seminar of this quarter. Uh, our speaker today is Professor Gregor Verbich from University of Sydney in Australia. He's going to talk about a, a transactive energy system for integrating distributed energy resources. I want to remind everyone that uh, all the presentations have been recorded. So if you miss any of them, uh, you can contact us or you can search on, uh, on YouTube. Professor Gregor Verbich received his degrees in electrical engineering from the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. Uh, he was a postdoc with the University of Waterloo in Canada. Since 2010, he has been with the School of Electrical and Information Engineering at the University of Sydney in Australia. His expertise is in, is in power system operations, stability and control, and electricity markets. His current research interests include grid and market integration of renewable energies distrib and distributed energy resources, demand response, and grid modeling. He was a recipient of the IEEE Power and en en Energy Society Prize Paper Award in 20 uh, 2006. And without further delay, let's welcome our speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. It's early morning here in Sydney. Uh, so my presentation today will be, um, we'll talk about transactive energy systems um, in the context of uh, integration of distributed energy uh, resources. Um, and maybe I should put this slide first. The presentation is mostly based in this paper, which was um, uh, recently published in the Renewable and Sustainable Energy Reviews. It's a review paper that reviews um, our work we've done over the last uh, several years in this area. So if you're interested, you may refer to this paper or um, the reference it's contained um, in the paper. So the agenda for today, I, first, I, I will first talk um, about the background and motivation. Um, give an overview of management and coordination of distributed energy resources. And then I will focus on specific approaches uh, discussing home energy management first. So when you uh, manage distributed energy resources in your home or may maybe your uh, small commercial building. And then I'll move on to coordination where you coordinate um, several distributed, so actually several prosumers into, into virtual power plants, um, you can do so, you can do so um, with or without taking into account the network. So the next one will be network aware coordination where you explicitly take into account um, the impact on the network. And then finally, I will discuss a conceptually quite uh, different approach, which is peer-to-peer -peer energy trading using, using auctions. And finally, I will conclude with, uh, with a comparative analysis comparing all the approaches using uh, technical and economic um, criteria. And finally, some, some conclusions. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I usually start my presentation going a little bit back um, into the past. This is uh, from the CSIRO. CSIRO, you can think of that as a national labs, uh, equivalent to national labs in the US. So back in 2013, CSIRO convened a so-called Future Grid Forum where they asked uh, several industry participants to come up with possible evolution scenarios for the electricity system in Australia and also um, globally. And they came up with four scenarios. And the first one is quite interesting because I find it quite visionary. Remember this was back in 2013, almost um, eight years ago. And it's called Rise of the Prosumers. So they predict that by 2050, um, the prosumers will take up on, so 46% of prosumers will have on-site generation and electric vehicles, um, and the role of centralized power will decline considerably. So there will be much more emphasis on decentralized power supply, and importantly, consumers will retain certain level of comfort. So uh, the autonomy is quite explicit in that, in that scenario. And the network um, then becomes a platform uh, uh, for transactions. So those two issues of uh, consumer autonomy and uh, the networks will pop up uh, several more times in my, in my presentation. Um, and another uh, scenario was renewables thrive um, where they predicted that uh, centralized power supply will 
almost exclusively consists of renewable renewables, large scale uh, wind and solar. Um, they also predicted uh, high electric vehicle uptake and strong demand control. And batteries will feature pro uh, prominently in, um, in future supply system. So at the moment, we are probably witnessing a combination of the two. So large penetration of uh, um, utility scale renewables at the transmission level and um, distributed energy resources at the uh, low voltage level. So um, now if we move um, a little bit further into the future, so this is from 2015, where the Australian energy market operator uh, came up with the prediction of the cost decline of uh, PV battery systems. So they predicted that um, in 2020, and this is for New South Wales, which is one of the states in Australia, where I'm based in Sydney, um, the payback period of residential PV battery systems will be around 15 years. Now, today it's probably closer to 10, um, and this is predicted to fall uh, further, further moving into the future, which means that PV battery system residential, small scale PV battery systems will become economically viable or, or already are economically viable without any um, subsidies, which obviously drives the, the uptake of, um, of these technologies. Now, if we want to uh, look a little bit deeper into the drivers of what drives the uptake of these technologies, um, I'm showing here a slide from a Morgan Stanley research from 2016. Um, where they um, so on the left hand side, uh, the left uh, sorry on the left hand side we have installation cost of a generic uh, seven kilowatt hour battery system. So they predicted that the cost will drop quite dramatically from 2016 to 2018. To be perfectly honest, the cost decline for battery storage is not as fast as they thought it would be, but it's still the cost is dropping. But more importantly, here on the right. I'm showing battery cost per kilowatt hour use versus value opportunities. So this chart on the left tells you that um, the battery cost of, uh, what, if, you, if you use one kilowatt hour um, of energy, if you move one kilowatt hour out of, in, of, of the battery, that costs you around 50, uh, between 50 and 100 uh, cents per, per kilowatt um, hour. And on the right, uh, we have um, just remove that screen. Um, <clears throat> we have the um, revenue opportunities. Now, at the moment, customers can only use the bottom two, which is uh, solar self-consumption. So basically, charge the battery when the sun is shining in the middle of the day, and nobody is using that energy. And tariff arbitrage. So if you are on a time of use tariff, you may charge the battery when the electricity is cheap and discharge when it's expensive. So you can see that currently those two value streams are not quite sufficient, um, are not um, are not sufficient. Um, um, well, that was in 2016 when this prediction was made. It was not sufficient um, to um, to cover the battery the battery cost. But in the future, they predicted that there will be several other opportunities will emerge for customers to play in different markets. So they call this collectively network services, which might be ancillary services for uh, low voltage networks, as well as, for example, frequency control services for the wholesale market. And uh, once those new value streams become available, you can see now that the total value of those uh, revenue opportunities exceeds the cost of the battery. And this just goes to show that when those new value streams become available, and this will um, drive the uptake of residential batteries even further. Now, here in the middle, we have VPPs. As I will discuss in my presentation, the boundary between network services and VPPs is, um, is, is blurred. It's not, it's not creased. So you can argue that they basically come in, in one bucket. Um, so, um, and then this is from 2018. Again, a prediction from the Australian energy market operator. Um, where they predicted the uptake of uh, batteries and um, rooftop solar. Now, just um, here on the left, we have capacity. So this is roughly uh, 20 gigawatts. And uh, peak capacity in the national electricity market, which is the interconnected system on the eastern seaboard of Australia, is probably double that number. So you can see that AEMO agrees, the Australian energy market operator agrees that um, 
the uptake of TV will indeed be quite significant, which then leads us to this prediction, which is quite remarkable. Um, this is again from the Australian Energy Market Operator and Energy Networks um, Australia, where in 2018, so they copied, they took this from Blue, Blue, Bloomberg. Um, they, um, Bloomberg predicted that by mid 2030s in Australia, so that's uh, this top graph, um, 45 percent of power will be generated in behind the meter. Behind the meter means in either residential <clears throat> or small commercial buildings, and that's quite remarkable because if you think <clears throat> if you think uh, uh, about the implication of that, we are effectively uh, predicting that we'll flip the operation of the power system from generation following load to load following um, generation. <clears throat> so, um, for the sake of the <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, for the sake of this presentation, I came up with this um, diagram um, or schematic diagram on the left, which shows um, a, a typical composition of a power system where we have transmission um, on the top. So this is this um, uh, reddish red color, uh, where we have bulk generation, and then we transmit power. Um, typically over long distances over the transmission system down to distribution and finally uh, finally to um, residential low voltage levels. So this is how a power system was um, um, or still is operated uh, traditionally. Now if we um, if we uh, look at the slide uh, sorry the picture on the right we have this like a simplified diagram that shows that this transmission system in the middle and then the power flow, Note the direction of those arrows. The power flow is downstream. So from generation down to medium voltage levels and finally to low voltage distribution where the customers are located. Now, when customers become prosumers, so when they take up distributed energy technologies, they can generate power themselves. And with the aggressive uptake of uh, DERs, um, we are already witnessing in some parts of the network here in Australia, South Australia and Queensland are two examples, where the power already flows upstream. Um, so you know, note here that the arrows now are two-way, which means that the power can flow from low voltage networks up to medium voltage and even to high voltage networks. And if that um, uh, prediction eventuates where we get almost half of the power from behind the meter, the power system will become really um, a two-way. Um, so the network, the, the power flows will, will become predominantly, predominantly two-way. Um, but there's an issue with that because know that prosumers are located at the low voltage level. So they are located at the fringes of the grid. And the capacity of low voltage network is limited. So as you increase the penetration of uh, prosumers, or you can think of that penetration of rooftop solar, which is the main distributed generation technologies, as the penetration goes up, you start witnessing networks problems. So note here that those bubbles become uh, darker and darker red, and that indicates voltage problems, uh, network problems, either voltage problems or congestion problems, where um, you exceed the capacity of the transformer and the cables. So as the penetration increases, um, networks, low voltage networks uh, becomes, become congested and uh, voltage limits are violated. And this is already happening in many parts of um, Australia to the extent that Australian Energy Market Commission came up um, with a proposal to charge customer for solar exports. So when you export solar into the grid in the middle of the day, they are suggesting that the customers, customers should be charged for that because the network, the, so for, to enable the network to, to get revenue required to augment um, their network. Now, note here that customers in Australia all, uh, also get a so-called feed-in tariff. So when they, from the retailer typically, so when they feed power into the grid, they get paid, paid the feed-in tariff. But on top of that, the networks are now uh, would like to charge customer for exporting the grid, which will then effectively reduce uh, reduce the revenue um, the revenue for the customers. 
Now, what that means is that it, this will probably drive the uptake of residential batteries even further, because um, if your only alternative um, when you generate power and you're not consuming it is to dump it into the grid and get paid nothing, customers will likely invest and invest in, into batteries. Okay, so that's the issues we have, um, we have today. Now, at the same time, um, we are witnessing um, a rapid development in several important technologies. And so the first one is ubiquitous uh, connectivity and this concept of internet, internet of things where effectively every devi device in the system can talk to any other device. And what that means in our context is that distributed energy resources can now become um, uh, system, system players. On top of that, um, smart devices have now a lot of computing power, which means that we can do a lot of computation on those small devices themselves. For example, in your smart meter, you may, you may run um, your home energy management uh, uh, system on a small a single board computer. Um, and another one is blockchain um, or distributed ledger technologies that will enable um, a distributed energy uh, marketplace. Now to drive this message home, here at the bottom, I have a slide from International Energy Agency um, where they show um, how, much, uh, how much money globally utilities are investing in digital um, electricity infrastructure or digital technologies in general. This is from 2016. So you can, you can see that even five years ago, the total global investment by utilities, utilities in digital technologies exceeded the investment in global uh, gas power generation. So this just goes to show that those um, underpinning technology will enable this vision of fully uh, decentralized power supply um, I talked about. So now I'm um, um, at the like uh, um, main um, uh, part of my presentation, where I will review um, management and coordination approaches of distributed um, energy resources. Now, for the sake of um, this presentation or in this paper, um, this paper here at the, at the bottom, which I um, mentioned initially, uh, we came up with with this diagram where we classify coordination approaches based on two criteria. The first one is the extent to which they take into account uh, networks. And the second one is the extent to which they explicitly focus on customers, either on customers or, um, or the system. And, and the approaches can be either network aware or completely network um, oblivious. So the first one is a home energy management system. So you, you can think of that, um, you are a, an end customer, you buy a rooftop solar system, a battery system, and you want to manage it to minimize your cost. Um, and that obviously sits in this bottom right corner where you are fully customer oriented and you don't care about the network at all. Um, and we saw that this can lead to network problems. So then the next approach is home energy management with, with operating envelopes. And these operating, operating envelopes, you can think of that as a distribution system operator telling you what you cannot, you can or cannot do um, in order to prevent, prevent network uh, problems. So now see, uh, note here that this approach is now uh, uh, much more network aware. Uh, then we have peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, sits somewhere in the middle. And finally, virtual power plants. Um, so I put a VPP, so I can call that network oblivious VPP, which is state of the art currently um, in Australia and also globally. Um, I put them in the top right corner because um, they are completely system oriented. Oriented, they don't, and they implicitly care about the customer, of course, of course. But um, customers are not explicitly taken into account in the objective, as we will see later. Um, and finally, we have network aware virtual power plants, um, and they are based on um, the solution of the optimal power flow problem. So they are fully network aware, but then the extent to which they take into account customers um, in the objective can, can vary as well. So first of all, home energy uh, management. So as I mentioned, when you invest in distributed energy technologies, uh, PV battery systems are the obvious ones. Then of course you would like to come up with an efficient uh, way of managing these technologies to minimize, um, to minimize uh, electricity cost. 
Uh, you can also focus on improving comfort, for example, if you are also scheduling your air conditioning um, and maybe some, some other objectives as well. Now, if we look at this more holistically, um, electric vehicles are probably becoming an important part of that, but you might also have um, uh, fuel cells or micro turbines for combined uh, heat and um, um, electricity generation, and possibly fuel pumps are now quite, quite popular in cold climates for, uh, for heating. So um, when you have a range of devices, then obviously you would like to optimize their performance um, or uh, their operation. And this can be cast as a sequential decision-making process um, under uncertainty, where you minimize some cost function. As I said, you can think of that as minimizing uh, electricity, electricity cost. Um, and you do so, you want to find a policy. So a policy, you can think of that as a, as a rule that tells you what you do in a particular situation. So for example, do I charge the battery? Do I discharge the battery and so on? Um, and in principle, you have some randomness. So this is not fully deterministic. Um, so that means that you have, you minimize um, expected cost over a uh, horizon. Now there are several solution techniques uh, mixed integer linear programming is probably the most popular one. It, the problem can also be solved um, dynamic programming, but it has to be emphasized that this problem is quite computationally challenging um, in itself. So now for the sake, um, so in, in this paper, uh, we used a fairly simpli a simplified home energy management uh, formulation where we only use a battery System. And this is a, the most typical situation currently in Australia. And we assume that we have a hybrid inverter. So we have one inverter to interface the PV battery system um, with the grid. And we have this user agent that uses electricity, um, some other um, uh, not, not flexible um, uh, demand. So now this problem, um, if you have a more, uh, more devices than uh, than you have you, you you probably have to formulate it using a mixed integer linear program. Um, but in this setting, assuming that um, the user pays um, a time of use tariff when ex when imports electricity from the grid and when, when the power flow is from the grid to the customer, the user pays a time of use tariff. But when it exports power to the grid, so for example, when PV is generating more than the user can consume, uh, the user gets um, a feed-in tariff. Now, because the feed-in tariff is always less than the time of use tariff, we can, um, we can uh, uh, linearize this problem or we can uh, um, uh, eliminate integer constraints completely by introducing two auxiliary variables to model that uh, net power flow exchange. So, um, so with this linear formulation, the problem becomes uh, minimize the amount of money the user pays when imports and minus uh, the money the user makes when exports uh, power into the grid. And again, the retail tariff can either be time of use or FT means flat tariff. So time of use is over a day and flat. And the feed-in tariff um, is uh, what you get paid when you export power to the grid, and this is always less less than the time of use tariff. So I won't dwell on that. Um, the details are in the paper. It's just a simple linear uh, linear problem. Um, um, and again, this is with complete disregard of of the impact on the network. Now we can rectify that by introducing so-called operating envelopes. And again, you can think of that as the distribution system operator telling customers what they can or can, uh, cannot do. And there are several ways you can do this. Um, what the approach we use is to use the power flow Jacobian, which effectively gives you sensitivities of um, active and reactive power injections on voltages and uh, phase angles in the network. And this obviously assumes that the distribution system operator runs state estimation. So, um, and also has a full observability of, um, of the network. So um, when you have access to the power flow Jacobian, you can, quink, you can quickly assess the impact on uh, the voltages um, by 
by using the sensitivities from the load flow Jacobian and looking at the power um, the customer um, injects into, into the network. Now, um, I haven't mentioned, or I did mention this explicitly, but um, voltages are probably the biggest issue when you increase the penetration of rooftop solar, because in the middle of the day, uh, when the demand is low and the sun is shining, TV systems generate power, they tend to raise voltages um, in the network. So what I said before that home energy management is completely network oblivious, that's not quite technically not quite true because the inverters now have to be, um, well, they do have protection settings. So if the voltages in the network go, uh, go too high, then the inverters will trip. So um, you can argue that uh, home energy management of prosumer uh, battery inverters, TV battery inverters are, are to some extent network aware. Okay, but a principal way of doing that is uh, having a, a system distribu distribution system operator in place that um, monitors uh, the system by doing state estimation, computing in real time um, the impact of, um, of uh, customers exporting power to the grid and sending back um, power limits to the customers which they have to obey in order to prevent network uh, problems. Okay, so those two approaches uh, were focus, focused explicitly on, um, on uh, customers. Now, virtual power plants, that's conceptually a different approach. And the idea is to aggregate a large number of consumers, so we can think of that again, um, behind the meter distributed um, energy resources located in, in residential buildings or maybe uh, commercial, small commercial buildings, uh, equipped with a home energy management uh, system and communicating uh, with the rest of the systems through a smart meter. Now, um, here I'm assuming that we have one physical network. So here I'm assuming that all the customers are connected to one low voltage network managed by the distribution system operator. But in principle, every customer can be under a different uh, retailer. So you can buy electricity um, in the market through a different retailer. We have, maybe we have several options. And then on top of that, uh, you might also have an aggregator. And in principle, there can be many of them um, that uh, sell services that your devices can provide to the grid that sell those services into the wholesale market. So that's the idea. Um, now, if we now look at um, uh, the implication of that, that model onto the system, here on the left, I have a, a, a deregulated power system, but with passive demand. So that would be probably what we have today or what we had maybe a, like 10 years ago, uh, where customers are fully uh, passive. So the power flow is from generators to transmission down to distribution and to the customers. And the financial flows are then in the other direction. So through the retailer, the market operator, and uh, finally to the generators. Um, now, when you, when customers become active participants in uh, the system, so they become prosumers. So now this changes. So you still have, um, I mean, customers can still buy electricity uh, from from the generator. So that would imply that the power flow is um, downstream, but they can also sell electricity into the grid or um, send electricity into the grid. So this power flow here becomes um, two way. Now, um, the retailer is still there as before, but on top of that, you also have an aggregator that can sell services uh, into either, either to the distribution system operator or to the wholesale market. And this is facilitated by, by an aggregator. And in principle, that can be um, the retailer and the aggregator um, can, be, can be one company. So this is still, still early days. Um, there is no... Um, um, this uh, sector is not, not far from mature yet. And the financial flows now note here that again, you still have a, um, a contractual uh, relationship with the retailer, um, but you can also make money by uh, selling services um, that through, through an aggregator. So now in principle, this can be um, uh, formulated as an optimization problem where you minimize some cost function um, 
And um, so, and that um, um, X are the decision variables. So that's uh, the feasible, um, uh, feasible set and includes uh, the aggregator, which is this entity here in the middle, user agents sitting at the bottom and the network variables managed by system operator. So that's a canonical um, aggregation problem. Um, now, before I go into specific details, I will first mention the state of the art, um, which is the business model that we already have in Australia. I call that retailer VPP or VPP 0, 0.0, which is probably um, the simplest VPP model you can you can think of. <clears throat> now, note here there is there is no optimization. <clears throat> so the VPP controller, um, which is owned by a retailer controls um, or has a, a contractual relationship with customers in different parts of the network. So note here that these prosumers are connected to different uh, low voltage networks. So they might be electrically um, far apart. And the business model of the retailer is to mitigate price exposure. So the retailer effectively uses customer owned batteries to uh, minimize the exposure in um, the wholesale market. So when the electricity price uh, goes up, they discharge batteries uh, to avoid buying electricity in the wholesale market because it's, it's too expensive. And this, is, this uses direct load control, so no, no, um, no optimization. Now note that battery controllers still, still um, uh, maximize self-consumption for the customer, can do price arbitrage, so battery controllers uh, still optimize the value of, of battery for the customer. Um, but the, the retailer, when it needs the capacity, it can overwrite, overwrite uh, those decisions. <clears throat> now, battery controllers, the state of the art, currently use some heuristics, so there is no, no optimization involved in that, even though there are companies who already do that. So which means that customer demand profiles are not considered. There is no uh, forward looking optimization. So for example, if you are not at home, then tomorrow, this is not taken into account in uh, optimal, also in the charging and discharging profile decided by the battery controller. So that's uh, suboptimal. Um, <clears throat> now I have to mention that um, in October this year, um, the, it will become possible for aggregators to beat also in the wholesale market. So this is called so-called demand response uh, mechanism rule change, which Australian Energy Market um, uh, Commission put in place. Now, interestingly, um, these, the aggregators will only be allowed to aggregate large scale loads, so no, not residential customers. Even though if you, if you read the report from the Australian Energy Market Commission, they acknowledge the fact that, that not in very not so distant future, um, the main technology for aggregation will be distributed energy resources. But because they consider is consider this too complicated at the moment, simply because you have so many of uh, these small devices at the moment, this rule change only allows aggregation of large scale um, customers. Okay, so now. Um, if you want to do this retailer VPP model in a principled way, you can formulate that as an optimization problem where you maximize um, social um, welfare. So you can, you can think of that, uh, you can think of the cost function as a quadratic cost function that, that um, uh, models the price of electricity um, in the wholesale market. But note here that the decision variables now also include uh, uh, the, the, the user agent, which effectively means that the retailer now uses customer batteries to minimize um, their own cost. Now, this is social welfare, so you can argue that customers also benefit, but customers are not explicitly taken into account um, in the objective. Now, you can rectify that by putting in the objective um, also the objective function of the customer, uh, which might be the same objective function as we have seen um, uh, for the home energy management um, problem. Now you can then, um, so this now becomes a, a by, by criterion optimization where you have this gamma here, uh, 
that tells you how much weight you put on each um, on each component. Um, now, you can argue that when you have a, a large number of customers, possibly in the thousands, uh, that solving that centrally, so this is a centralized solution, it's not feasible. Um, you can uh, you can solve this problem in a distributed fashion um, where you use dual decomposition and this effectively becomes a price based coordination where in each iteration um, you start with an initial uh, price up update which is the dual variable associated with the power balance constraint um, user agents optimize based on on the existing uh, price update um, the aggregators do that um, for their own sub problem and they update those Lagrange multipliers. You can think of that as a new price. They send it back to the users and that after a couple of iterations, um, you reach a solution. So now this is fully scalable, scalable and that computation is done locally on smart meters on the devices owned um, by the customers, which again allows you to scale that to several thousands, tens of thousands of customers. Now, arguably, if you have also um, integer variables in the problem uh, that becomes a bit more complicated because uh, you have a non-zero duality gap but we came up with a solution which in this if you're interested um, you can look for for details okay now so far we haven't considered the impact on um, on the network um, and this can be um, taken into account by reformulating the vpp 1.0 and 2.0 .2 optimization problem um, into an optimal power flow problem. So optimal power flow, you can think of that as economic dispatch um, subject to network constraints. So again, you are minimizing some global cost function. You can put in the objective also the cost function of, um, of the consumers. So that part remains the same. Uh, now note here that network constraints are now also um, are also explicitly taken into account in the objective. So here we have the power uh, power flow constraints. So that then becomes conceptually similar as before, except that now that network constraints are explicitly taken into account in the optimization um, as well. Um, now, as a result of having the network constraints um, in the objective, the sub problems become coupled. So the decomposition I mentioned before doesn't work anymore. Um, so you have to use, um, Another approach, and we used um, uh, ADMM, the uh, the so-called um, alternating direction of multipliers uh, method, which again you can think of it as a price-based coordination. So you also um, exchange prices in each iteration. There are some other technicalities you have to make, um, you have to uh, satisfy in order for this to work. So I won't really go into details, but you have the references um, available in the paper if you want to. Uh, to learn um, more details. Okay, so now the way I see this is, um, so we start with this uh, retailer retailer VPP or um, VPP 1.0, um, and then, uh, sorry, 0, 0.0, and then we move to an optimization base, which is VPP 1, uh, 1.0, and you can take into account also um, customer um, objective, you take into account also uh, network constraints and then you end up with this uh, VPP 3.0, which is fully network aware. So network constraints that are taken into account explicitly, which is important in this possible future where half of the power comes from behind the meter um, resources and customers are also included um, in the objective. Now we actually trialed that technology um, in, in a recently completed trial on Bruni, um, Bruni Island. It was funded by Australian Renewable um, Energy Agency. Um, there were three universities, Australian National University, University of Tasmania, and us, um, network service provider, TAS Networks, and technology provider, um, Reposit Power. So basically what we did, we uh, coordinated 32 batteries while taking into account both uh, the demands of the, the network, um, as well as um, um, objectives of customers to manage network constraint on a constraint part of the network on Bruny Island um, in Tasmania. Okay, now, so finally, peer-to-peer uh, -peer energy trading. Now, this is conceptually quite, quite different. 
So the idea here is, and this is uh, similar to um, this borrows concepts from shared economy like Uber or um, Airbnb, um, Airbnb, where in principle, every prosumer can trade power with any other um, prosumer in the network. And this is different from, from the existing model where you have to uh, trade through a central, uh, central pool. Now, in the context of low voltage um, electricity markets, of, uh, in the context of um, aggregation of distributed energy resources, um, you can only do so on a single low voltage network. So peer to peer is not possible if you have prosumers located in different parts of the network, because if you were to send power to the other part of the network, the losses will simply be uh, prohibitive. So you are restricted to doing that in a, in a single low, um, low voltage um, network. So that's uh, conceptually uh, how this peer-to-peer -peer trading uh, looks like. There are several approaches. Um, I just mentioned one for the sake of completeness, completeness which is multi-bilateral um, uh, economic dispatch, which is similar to economic dispatch in a wholesale market, except that now, uh, you trade power between prosumers and you represent the welfare of sellers with a utility function, uh, welfare of buyers with another utility function, which appear um, in the objective. So I won't go into, um, into details. Um, instead, I will focus on, um, I will focus on um, auctions, um, which we did quite a bit of research in. Um, so, some preliminary concepts. So, if you um, you can think of you can think of a peer-to-peer -peer market that consisting of two uh, sets. The first is the set of sellers, and then you have uh, then you have um, the buyers. And the trade is this uh, four tuple where you have a buyer, uh, seller, transaction price, and transaction quantity, or the power you sell. Or, where buyers uh, utility is modeled well with this utility function, and the seller. Um, has um, another utility function. So this borrows concepts from from micro uh, from micro um, economics. So um, and the way to uh, to realize this market is to use an uh, auction of some some, some type. Um, so the first auction we used is a continuous double auction, uh, which consists of multiple buyers and sellers. So this is uh, typical um, uh, uh, similar to to eBay. Um, and this auction requires an, an auctioneer. So it's like a third party that, 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 that clears transactions, that clears transactions uh, between buyers and sellers. And this can be supported by a distributed ledger like a blockchain so that you can get a completely decentralized, uh, decentralized um, market uh, place. Now, of course, you can, ask, you can ask yourself a question. So how do you come up with an optimal bidding strategy for, a, for an end customer? Um, now you have to understand that this is a, a thin market. So the number of players in the market is not huge. So which means that finding an optimal bidding strategy is rather difficult. So that's why we use this concept of uh, zero intelligent plus uh, traders, where you, um, um, where you have some, um, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm re wrap this up probably in five minutes. Um, <clears throat> where um, um, you have some automated mechanism that adaptively adjust the bidding prices um, um, in, um, from, from, for the buyers and sellers um, they sell into the market. Okay, so I will skip the details. I mean, this is quite, quite dense. So if you're interested, um, there are papers. Uh, so this overview paper plus the references contained in that paper, you can look for more details, um, details uh, there. So I will skip um, all of that. So just maybe just one thing I would mention is that peer-to-peer -peer energy trading um, is probably easier to implement because it doesn't require this central optimization. It can be it can be bolted on on the existing um, market model, um, and the net the impact on network constraints can also be taken into account uh, using this uh, network permission structure, which is conceptually similar. To the operating envelopes um, I mentioned before, so we have a distributed uh, distribution system operator that constantly monitors transactions and then prevents buyers or seller doing something that will um, 
that will um, violate network uh, constraints. Okay, so I will conclude this with a comparative analysis. Um, we used we used a, um, a distribution network model, low voltage distribution network model consisting of a hundred um, uh, customers. Uh, Thirty customers didn't have any DR, so these are the uh, these ones in black. Uh, the green ones had uh, PV and battery systems, whereas the yellow ones had um, uh, PV only. And the, the prices we used again is the time of use, which is this one in red, flat tariff in blue, and dark blue is the feed-in uh, feed tariff. Um, so before that, we, we tested, um, so we increased the penetration of PV and we found out that as you exceed uh, three kilowatts per customer, then you get network problems, um, network problems, um, um, or voltage voltage problems. So this line is um, these are the voltages uh, at at each node in the system as you increase the penetration of customers. So this here. So what it means is that you pretty much have to limit. You have to put a blank kilowatts on on the export uh, for the export of each customer in order to prevent uh, voltage uh, uh, violations in the network. Okay. So. Um, so here I'm showing network congestion or transformer capacity. So maybe this is a fairly fairly busy slide, so I won't really have the time to unpack all of that. So maybe just one thing to highlight is when you do this home energy management uh, with complete disregard of the network, you can see that in the middle of the day you get reverse power flows uh, that exceed the, the transformer uh, capacity. Um, but this is obviously avoided um, in OPF time approaches uh, where you um, uh, where you explicitly take into account network constraints. And peer-to-peer -peer with network permission structure um, is also effective in reducing, in reducing uh, network problems. So the comparison here is shown for flat tariffs and time of use tariffs. Um, now for voltages, a uh, similar story. Uh, you can see that in the middle of the day, so this here is time, uh, that's customer index. Uh, you can see that in the middle of the day, you get voltage problems, which is indicated by this dark red uh, color. Um, so obviously for home energy management with a complete disregard of the network, you get voltage problems, but in um, OPF time approaches, um, these are avoided. Now, finally, some economic um, uh, conclusions. So here I uh, have total energy exported by users and uh, um, sorry, uh, for flat and, and time of use tariffs. So maybe one thing to note is that peer-to-peer -peer trading um, significantly limits the amount of power users can export in the network. And this stems from the fact that you are only allowed to sell power into the grid if you find the buyer, which doesn't happen always, which quite limits the amount of power you can export. Um, here are cash flow comparisons. One thing to note is that this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, with network permission structure actually um, actually um, ends up ends up uh, making money for the customer. So the amount of money you pay to buy electricity is less than what you get when you sell electricity into, to the market. And see, that's simply because you can sell power at a price that is higher than the time of use uh, tariff. Um, but note here that also the customers who buy power, they do it for a price that is less than the applicable time of use tariff. So eventually, uh, eventually everyone uh, benefits. Okay, um, I will skip that. So here, here we rank customers. Um, so this here was uh, cumulative. We bundled all the customers together. Here we rank customers um, all a hundred of them um, uh, based on the performance and we grouped those approaches based on statistical uh, similarity. So for energy exported, you can see that peer-to-peer -peer and home energy management is the least beneficial um, this, uh, and the, the other ones performed uh, fairly, fairly similarly. So this is for um, energy exported and the net uh, cash flow. Okay, so some conclusions. Um, probably the main conclusion is that uh, DR coordination can take many shapes um, and forms. Um, 
And also very importantly, active network management will be required moving into the future as the penetration of these devices um, increases. Um, now optimization based approaches, if you do, the, do this in a distributed fashion, that will require frequent communication between, uh, between agents, um, which might impose um, a significant burden on the communications network. And the um, an open question is how to reward consumers for offering services into the network. One option would be to use dual variables of the power balance constraint, which is um, a locational marginal prices, although that has some problems. So this question is still not, uh, not, not answered. Peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer approaches are easier to um, implement compared to optimization-based approaches because, as I said, they can simply bolt it on onto the existing um, market uh, framework. Um, and PV curtailment, which is implicit in OPF-based approaches, or, or even network, if you use a network permission structure, um, depends on electrical distance, so can be unfair. Um, so this is just one, one slide from our recently published paper, where we show that if you just curtail customers, the customers at the end of the feeder will be curtailed more simply because of the electrical distance. And we came up with um, several approaches with, uh, that do that in a more uh, fair and equitable fashion. Um, and may, maybe final, final slide is that this um, aggregation will probably have to be done in layers. So first level of aggregation on the low voltage network, then medium voltage network, and finally taking um, the whole network. Um, because simply doing a full end-to-end -end market would be uh, would be simply uh, too too complex. Okay, so uh, that was all from me. So we have um, a few minutes left um, for questions. So please go ahead if you if you have any questions. As I said, the presentation was quite dense, uh, but there were pointers to other papers. If you're interested in more in more details, you can refer to those papers and um, um, find 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 more information there. While we're waiting for the audience to type their questions, I, I have uh, uh, one question related to solve your last slide. When you mm -hmm. consider the uh, impact from the on the networks from Consumers, uh, how how big of the network should you consider? This is one in your example. I think you have you consider one substation, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So low voltage networks in Australia are around a hundred, a few hundred customers. So typically, mm -hmm. um, low voltage networks in in Europe and Australia are a bit different to uh, what you guys have in North America. Um, mm -hmm. So the number of customers in one low voltage network can be a few hundreds, for example, between 0 0.5 megawatts and maybe 1.5 megawatts. Um, yeah. Okay. But in a medium, medium voltage, medium voltage networks can be possibly up to 50 megawatts. So maybe up to a um, tens of um, low voltage networks in one. So that would be a medium voltage would be that. So probably mm. up to, so ten, several tens of low voltage networks, several thousands, several thousands of customers. Um, to, to, to understand the actual impact, uh, uh, do, I, do I really have to consider several thousand you know, at that level? You know, this, this problem is like in transportation, right? You, if something happens locally, you don't yeah. know how, you know, the type of impact uh, in, in the upstream and how far in the upstream should you, you know, consider. Yeah, the, this is still this is still uh, being worked out. So as I said, currently uh, network companies in Australia use simply blanket constraints. So in congested network, they simply say you can export three kilowatts at it, but that obviously is not economic. It's not optimal because sometimes the network can take more, um, and there are other opportunities to use that power using peer-to-peer um, -peer approaches and so on. But this is so. But there, there are other approaches are emerging. So the one we demonstrated on Bruny Island is one approach. Um, network companies here are working on operating envelopes that dynamically adjust the export mm -hmm. limit so as to make better use of the available um, power. So here I have. Um, let, let, let's let's go through the questions. Yeah. So the wind and so... solar. Yeah, it's currently rejected. Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. So 
electric vehicles, I think, are a perfect dancing partner for uh, for distributed energy uh, uh, energy uh, generation. Unfortunately, in Australia, this hasn't been recognized yet by the federal government. So our federal government is not very progressive, and they're actively not not actively helping with the uptake of electric vehicles. But I guess moving into the future uh, to make good use of all that generation that is available in the middle of the day, charging electric vehicles basically for free, it uh, seems to be a no-brainer. But the, the big question will be how to come up with business models because suddenly you have um, um, integration of several sectors that were currently that currently live in silos. You will have to aggregate them. So to probably, um, so now you buy electricity, uh, which is uh, one service, then transportation is another service. Um, all of that will then in, in the future probably become um, part of an, an integrated energy service. So you might have a, a retailer might also offer you an electric car uh, and a rooftop solar and a battery uh, on top of your um, power connection. Maybe, maybe there's a solution, but definitely electric vehicles um, are, are the, uh, um, a perfect dancing partner to solve this problem while also maximizing the benefits for the customers. Now that some studies show that electric uh, is actually reduced uh, bidirectional. Yeah, so bidirectional charging. So then again, this is, um, of course, the more you cycle the battery, the more it degrades. So bidirectional charging or this um, vehicle to home or vehicle to grid concept obviously has um, some downsides. Batteries, battery degradation will be affected. My answer to that would be at the end of the day, if the, the, the value of all those additional value streams um, exceeds um, the cost, the additional cost, then this will be done. Um, so if you can make, I mean, if you have to, if you have to replace your car battery in seven years as opposed to 10 years, but you make more money, over those seven years, I guess you will be happy. You will be happy to do that. So again, the question is: so we have to come up with business models that will that will um, allow that. Where you might anticipate the next best and most most likely power consumption areas of the application? Um, I mean, this is already happening in Australia. Uh, low voltage networks, um, as I say, are saturated with PV, so you have too much PV already. So network companies are now are now uh, looking. So network companies, um, by network companies, I mean operators of low voltage networks, they are the most affected because of course network limits are violated. So they are now at the bleeding edge and they are now trying to come up with solutions. As I said, blanket constraints are the most, uh, the most blunt instruments. They are now coming up with more dynamic operating envelopes. Um, optimal power flow approach might be another solution. I guess, um, when additional value streams become available, I mentioned this demand response mechanism. So when it becomes possible for end customers to offer services um, for offer services to the wholesale market, and also when network companies start using behind the meter distributed energy resources as a non-network solution, so that's the term they use. If you want to deal with network congestion, you can use um, well devices in people's homes. When all of those services become possible, additional value streams will become available, then retailers will become part of the story. So currently network service providers don't typically talk to retailers, so they are still two separate services, even though their models and the impact they have are highly um, intertwined. So this hasn't quite happened yet, but we are moving into that um, direction. Um, which part? He would be responsible for maintaining the resilience of the power supply. Okay, now resilience, um, I'm not sure if I correctly, correctly understand the meaning of the term. Resilience is typically associated with um, the resilience of power networks uh, to network, uh, sorry, uh, to um, uh, climate disasters. Um, so, that would be the responsibility of uh, well the Australian energy market operator. They set the target for reliability and also well, resilience is not currently explicitly taken into account. It is implicitly in their operating procedures. Um, 
maybe one comment um, to increase resilience of the grid. If you can operate parts of the network when the network goes down, so when the like a bulk transmission goes down, if you can operate low voltage networks put, uh, in an islanded fashion, so you disconnect low voltage networks from the from the, the main network and you operate them as microgrids in an isolated fashion, that would of course increase the, the resilience of the grid. I think in California it happened that um, where you have the um, uh, wildfire danger, you disconnect it customers from, from the grid in order to prevent uh, further wildfires. Um, and that's obviously not um, not a good solution. Um, and also when, when as, as I said, when the network goes down, if you can still operate parts of the network supported by distributed energy resources located in that network, that obviously would decrease the resilience. But we, I, I haven't seen any, any business models um, in that space um, yet. Um, have peer-to-peer -peer energy trading models reached pilot tests? Uh, yes, uh, there was a test um, in in um, in Western Australia. Um, what they didn't consider, they didn't consider the impact on the network. Um, there are currently uh, there are currently many trials going on um, in Australia. If you are interested, um, Arena Australian Renewable Energy Agency, um, you had. I had their logo on the slide with the uh, Bruny Island project. If you are interested, Google Arena and go to the list of projects. They, they currently support many projects in this space. Um, obviously, the optimization-based solutions um, uh, I mentioned in this slide, you can think of that as a gold standard, which requires, might be considered too complex. So. Um, network companies and retailers and are now coming up with solutions that you can think of that are try to approximate that solution, try to come up with something that achieves a similar objective, but with less, less complexity. So there are many trials currently um, going on in Australia. And also in the paper I mentioned on the second slide, if you go at the end, we have a list of trials already uh, also included in that paper. So that would be maybe a good starting point uh, for you to read. Um, have there been studies for a practical and optical, optimal mix between firm power supply and DRs? Uh, this is another excellent question. Um, firming, firming is now a big discussion point in Australia. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept, so firming basically means that you have variable renewables um, and you have to, you have to um, uh, uh, ensure that you have sufficient supply uh, which you can, so essentially you are filling the gaps when the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining. You can fill this gap with batteries. Gas fired power generation is another option. Um, distributed energy resources can be, can be um, also a very good solution. Um, but it is, as I said, the main issue at the moment is that um, it's still quite, I mean, this is Every, any solution involving end customers is, is quite complex simply because of the sheer number of them, but also the business models currently, I mean, will span several, um, uh, several well, sectors of, of the electricity supply chain, retailers, network operators, possibly the system operator. Um, so, um, it, it can be, it can be from the business, solely from the business perspective, it can be quite complex. So we haven't quite, I mean, we are not, we are not there yet. I guess it will move in that direction. I guess that eventually we'll find the sweet spot between the managerial complexity and technical, technical and economic benefits. But um, yes, to answer your question, distributed energy resources, I, I see them as a, as a main ingredient of a, of a future power system where um, we might, especially given the fact that we might get half of the power from, from, from these devices. So we'll have to take them into account and we'll have to, to make, um, to make this, um, this happen. Um, yeah. Vibrant clean energy study. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I think, uh, yeah. Thanks for answering all the questions. Uh, yeah, and thank you for giving us a, a wonderful presentation. Now, uh, so, uh, we're eight minutes after past the, the hour, so if there are no more questions, um, uh, we'll end the presentation here. And thank you very much again. Okay, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you for having me.
Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah, have a good night. Yeah, bye. bye.